If neuroscience does not get involved with education, and if educators do not learn about neuroscience, we're going to have more neuromyth. So an important part of having an authentic dialogue is to get rid of the neuromyth, and the other important thing about a dialogue will be to introduce new ideas about how we learn, which can really make teaching and learning more effective and more productive. The psychological experiments that have been undertaken have confirmed that and even shown that there's sometimes benefit in receiving information in a style that is not your preferred learning style. The neuroscience tells us that the brain is so interconnected that such an idea of categorizing people in terms of left or right brain or visual, auditory, kinesthetic is, is a bad starting point. Right, you know, in terms of the biology, it doesn't make sense. This idea that learning problems linked to brain differences cannot be remediated by education, that suggests that if you have a diagnosis of dyslexia or dyscalculia, which we know are linked to brain differences, that that means they are biologically determined and there is nothing that you can do about them. So how teachers think about brain development in terms of the genetic contribution influences their attitude in the classroom. And that's why I feel it's really important for teachers to know more about how the brain developments, develops and the role of genetics and the role of the environment and the most important part of the environment, if you ask me, is the school, how that influences brain development. It's very difficult to talk about how one brain region operates um, completely independently of, of other parts of the network that it's connected to. Um, <clears throat> and all the brain is active all the time. We have a lot of newspaper articles uh, in, a, in our country about the importance of water. And in fact, in one brain-based book, uh, they encourage children to sing to the tune of Frere Jacques, which I'm not sure I can do. <coughs> with this throat, but you're encouraged to sing, Let, let's drink water, I love water, it gives me energy. This idea that you know, the more water you drink, the better you're going to get at your, your schoolwork. And there is a sort of neurosis in our country. You see mums chasing after children with their water bottle to make sure they, they drink enough. If you're a coffee drinker, or if a child is drinking two cans of cola a day, that they're Cognitive function only goes up to normal when they've had their fix of caffeine. Okay, and the rest of the time it's actually suppressed. The message is that all of childhood, up until the late teenage years, is actually a special time for learning. And it is not possible to say that, that interventions should always be earlier. It depends what the intervention is and who the intervention is targeting. Generally speaking, if you're talking about cognitive function and children who are disadvantaged or children who are suffering a developmental disorder or have difficulties, then that is probably a good time to be doing an intervention. But other interventions, for example, risk-taking, which is a, can be a serious problem amongst teenagers, doesn't make sense if we're thinking about that as the earlier the better. It just does not work. Sometimes we look at pictures like this and we say, oh, look, the children with and without dyscalculia have different brain activities. It must be a biologically determined disorder. But no, actually, these sorts of neuroscience studies are showing us how plastic the brain is um, and how influenced it can be by the correct intervention. You are likely to be paying attention more if you do regular exercise. And in fact, in this intervention here, we can see when we compare physical exercise with listening to a, a, an audio book, these teenagers did 30 minutes a day, and their response times are much faster after doing physical exercise. But the two things which really contribute to a lack of sleep, other than circadian rhythms that we know about with teenagers, are technology and caffeine. That sleep is not just about avoiding sleepiness the next day. If you lose sleep, you will remember less about what you learn tomorrow because you'll be more tired, but you will also remember less about what you learned today. Then it gets a spike of dopamine as if it knows it's going to get the reward, and then the dopamine ramps up until the outcome is known. Now that means if you integrate over time, there is more midbrain dopamine for uncertain reward than either totally expected reward or totally unexpected reward. So uncertain rewards stimulate the reward system much more. And yet we don't really do that in schools. 
there is a greater emotional response when you are answering the question in that context, in a gaming context, with uncertain reward, than certain reward. In other words, the uncertain reward transforms the emotional experience of tackling the academic task.